Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Jerry's buzzing around out there somewhere. I'm sorry. Uh, and this is short stuff, like I think I said. Yeah, the tsetse fly. Something that if uh, if you took high school biology, you talked about these little fellows. The what fly? The tsetse fly. I thought we were talking about fruit flies. Isn't that the tsetse fly? I don't think so. Is that different? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I always thought the tsetse fly was the, the same thing as the fruit fly, no? No, because I think the tsetse fly, is that how you say it? Um, yeah. Pr- gives, like, passes around dengue fever. Oh, well, just never mind then, everybody. What we're really talking about <laughs> is the fruit fly, a.k.a. the drosophila, and it's impossible to read this next word without reading it like, like this, uh, melanogangster. <laughs> but it's not gangster, unfortunately. Right. It's melanogaster. Yeah. Most people call them drosophila, though. Oh, I've always heard uh, drosophila, no? Oh, man, I don't know. Now that you say no. that, I've never heard it out loud. I've always seen it in writing. So you... when you said most people say it that way, you just lied. <laughs> so what I mean is, oh, my gosh, yeah, I totally <laughs> just did. Thank you for calling me out for that. I just am a lying machine, apparently, because I didn't even well, realize it. <laughs> they're Milano gangsters, no matter what. Okay. So we're talking, let's just call them fruit flies. How about that? Or tsetse flies. <laughs> but there is a bunch, and by the way, tsetse flies are large biting flies, so that is definitely uh, not these. Jeez. Um, I don't know where Now we that. have to do a short stuff on those guys. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, literally, uh, probably one-eighth of the show is now misinformation. So... <laughs> Um, fruit flies, specifically, how did you say it? Drosophila? Uh, that's what I said. It's much more beautiful than what I said, <laughs> so I'm going to go with that, too. You know, most people say Drosophila. Um, the, those particular kinds of fruit flies, Drosophila melan- melanogaster, they are um, widely used in scientific experiments, and it turns out, as a lot of people know, that we use fruit flies in experiments— uh-huh. They've actually bestowed a tremendous amount of information to us humans um, through their biology, through their genetics, through the very, the very, their very existence. We owe a great debt to them scientifically because a lot of them have been asked to sacrifice their lives in the for the furtherance of human knowledge. Yeah, and there's a bunch of reasons which we're going to get to kind of here and there in a sec, but. Uh, you dug up this kind of interesting bit from February 1947, mm-hmm. uh, V2 rocket, full to the brim. Well, not full to the brim, but <laughs> a lot of fruit flies were loaded up on this thing. Right. Uh, traveled 67 miles up into the air, which is technically uh, an altitude, which is one mile into actual space, according to NASA. Right. And they were the very first animals to go into space. Yeah, and they actually survived that trip. Um, and not one of, like, they were the first animal. They were they were like a, a test animal to see. Scientists were like, well, no one's ever been to space. We have no idea what happens out there. Maybe these things are going to come back all mutated and everything. And when they didn't, when they actually survived the flight and the reentry, um, they said, oh, well, let's start sending more larger animals up. And they did, and eventually we uh, ended up on humans, and that's what we're sending up these days. That's right, but it was very instructive uh, to see those flies come back without, you know, seven eyeballs mm-hmm. or tw- or twice the size or ten times the size. Mm-hmm. They were they were fine. They didn't hulk out. Yeah, and by, and by that, yeah, no purple ripped pants to be found. <laughs> Um, right. By that time, by 1947, they had actually been used in biological studies for well over a decade. Um, in the 1930s in particular, they basically helped establish the the field of modern genetics. Um, a guy uh, named um, Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan, basically showed that inheritance is passed along via chromosomes using a fruit fly study, and he did it in months rather than years that his other fellow early geneticists took to to prove their studies and actually end up winning a Nobel Prize for it. And in fact, at least five people have won Nobel Prizes from directly working with fruit flies. Yeah. I mean, if you want a Nobel Prize, not a bad place to start. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and the reason why, or maybe we should take a break and then talk about some of the reasons why. Okay. Right, right after this? Yes. Stop. 
You know, my friend, more than 75% of identity theft victims who had accounts opened in their name did not find out they had been victimized from their bank or their credit card company. Yeah, so don't be one of the 75% who didn't check more places identity theft could be hiding. Get LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. That's right. LifeLock sees certain threats you could miss if you're only monitoring your credit and bank statements, and they'll alert you if they find something that could be suspicious. Yeah, plus, if you become a victim of identity theft, a U.S.-based identity restoration specialist dedicated to your case will work to fix it. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but LifeLock can help protect your personal information. That's right. So join now and save up to 25% off your first year just by going to LifeLock.com slash stuff. That is L-I-F-E-L-O-C-K dot com slash S-T-U-F-F for 25% off. All right. The reasons why fruit flies are really great uh, are multifold. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the reasons, if you're going to study genetics, what you need to study is generations. Right. And fruit flies are really quick. Uh, They can create a new generation in about two weeks. Yeah. So that means you can study generation after generation in short order. Uh, They are very easy to breed in the lab. Um, They're small. They don't put up much of a fuss. No, all they ask for is... Easy to care for. Yeah, they just want a little cornstarch and sugar soup, and they're happy. Yeah, a little fruit, maybe. Yeah. Um, Yeah, you don't even have to give them fruit. That's really... Cornstarch and sugar soup is is fine with them. But, yeah, ultimately, I'm sure they prefer the real deal, you know. But if they're being raised in a lab their entire life and... Uh, countless generations that they of their lineage before them have been raised in a lab, they'll take the cornstarch and sugar soup if that's all they can get. Right. But why, oh, why, my friend, if you're going to study human genetics, yeah. would, would you even bother looking at a fruit fly? Well, that's a great question, Chuck. And the answer to it is that we share a surprising number of genes with fruit flies. Um, apparently, 8,000 of our 20,000 to 25,000 genes are analogous to fruit fly genes. That's so, really amazing. Yeah. So if you study those genes in fruit flies, you can extrapolate to humans, you know, what they do, what happens when you poke them with a whatever, um, mm-hmm. what happens if you shine a light on them, <laughs> if you're doing an optogenetic study. Um, that There's a lot of questions that we've answered through genetics because of that benefit of having similar genes. And apparently 75% of the genes known to cause diseases in humans are, are, are shared between humans and fruit flies too. It's so cool. Uh, another cool thing you can do if you want to say, oh, I don't know, like what if you live in uh, the Arctic and you're always, or, or the greater northern uh, climates of Canada, and you're just basically cold all the time. What mm-hmm. is that going to do to your gene activity and your metabolism? Well, let's put 2,000 fruit flies in a in a chamber and make it super cold all the time. Right. And look at them and see what happens. You can get a large population study very, very easily because these little fellows are so tiny. Yeah. They also share, in addition to genes, a lot of the same biochemical pathways that humans have, too. Um, one example I saw is that they don't actually get Alzheimer's, but they have all of the same pathways and, and brain structures that Alzheimer's um, befalls in humans. So we can study those pathways and try to treat Alzheimer's just by looking at um, these, these pathways and these uh, brain structures in fruit flies. Yeah, I also thought it was funny when you look at the downside of fruit flies, <laughs> aside from just some of the genetic components, the biggest downside, it seems like, is that they're fruit flies. <laughs> and fruit flies are super annoying. They really are very annoying. Um, they're apparently what's called a cosmopolitan species. So wherever humans are, they're going to be there too. And the reason why is apparently because we live in conditions that they find very suitable, like um, moderate temperatures that are fairly mm-hmm. stable. And we like fruit too. And sometimes we leave our fruit out and it gets a little past ripe and the fruit flies say, thank you, sir oh, or madam. Yeah. They yeah. doff their little top hat, um, click their heels together with their spats, and they go to town on that juicy banana. 
Yeah. Which, or which if, I guess if you have a juicy banana, you want to throw that out. Yeah. But did you see that listener mail, by the way, about the uh, banana bread banana? No. Someone emailed about something you said and said that I think one of the big reasons, too, is because they get really, really sweet. Mm. Is why you want to use an old banana. I gotcha. But anyway, the fruit flies love all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so if you live near a dumpster, unfortunately for you, which I did in my apartment in Los Angeles. Oh, boy. I uh, had a dumpster behind my apartment, which is where I found my cat, Laron, by the oh. way. Well, then so it wasn't it all, all bad. worked out, yeah. <laughs> uh, or if you compost, God help you. Um, it's a great thing to do, but you're going to be dealing with some fruit flies. You are. And again, I mean, there's really not a lot besides annoyance that fruit flies provide humans. Like they don't transfer or transmit communicable diseases. Yeah. They're not a disease vector. And on the on the flip side of that, they've actually stood in as models for um, disease carrying insects. Like we know a lot about how mosquitoes transmit um, disease by studying fruit flies as models. So they basically annoy us, but they've furthered our understanding in medicine in countless ways. And yet we're still like, yeah, but they're annoying. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know. That's so human. It is, but they're not like that rat, the, the tsetse fly. No, <laughs> that dengue fever spreading mofo. Uh, and apparently if you, you know, if you do compost like inside and you have a, even if you have a thing with a lid, they're going to gather around. You can set up a little little vinegar jar, like a canning jar with vinegar at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, and then a top made of plastic wrap with some holes in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can trap them and even remove them safely, I think, if you want. Yeah, just throw them out in the yard and say, go find a juicy banana because I don't want it. Although you, it is true, you can use those for banana bread, I forgot. Yeah. So fruit fly is ahoy. The next time you see a fruit fly, don't swat at it. Say, thank you, fruit fly. Your kind has been very beneficent to my kind, and I appreciate that. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and so, since Chuck said that's right and tapped his watch, short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.